Hello and welcome to the ninth episode. Today we have a wonderful guest that's been on a huge journey himself. He's been in entrepreneurship since 23, found, uh, founding and uh, putting together his own business. So he's been for a really long journey of entrepreneurship, of uh, running companies and going back into entrepreneurship. And now what he's doing is he's helping fitness professionals and gym owners to build their businesses. I would like to welcome James Quigley. Welcome, Hello, James. Um, thank you. Welcome. Thank, welcome yourself. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'm glad that you've made it. I'm thankful for your time. And today, I believe we're going to uh, share a lot of wisdom nuggets from the journey that you've undertook. Uh, having been into business for that long, I believe that you have a lot of a lot of value to share with uh, solopreneurs as well as people who are building a business out of their companies. So let's start from uh, discovering your background and where you're from. So well, one, thank you again for having me on here. It's, a, it's, it's absolutely an honor to talk to you. Um, so I started, uh, grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Um, grew up in a time where Brooklyn looked very different than maybe what some people may know it today. Uh, it was in the 80s and the 90s. So it was, I grew up in a blue collar family. Uh, my father was a very hardworking man. Uh, he was a mechanic, tow truck driver, you know, had hands of steel. But he also lived an alternative life. He grew, you know, he was also uh, moonlighted working in organized crime and things of that nature. Um, so that had a very big impact on me as a child. Uh, but growing up through that, you know, you take away a lot of different uh, learning experiences on how to be on your own. And through my upbringing, I very early I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur very early. I wanted to be like my dad, you know, I wanted to own my own stuff. You know, he, had, he always owned his own uh, businesses and I got my first opportunity at 23 where uh, oh, it was about 22 moving into 23. Uh, I had an opportunity where it didn't look like an opportunity. So the person I worked for who was a tremendous, tremendous guy. Uh, came to me one day and just kind of caught me off guard and said, hey, listen, I'm going to have to fire you. Or I'm going to give you another choice. So I can fire you and you can basically take over this store. Yeah. Or the alternative is you come with me. I'm about to become the largest Verizon dealer in the East Coast. You can come with me and you can get a nice cushy job, nice cushy salary, and you can work for me for the rest of your life. Your choice. Or I can fire you today. I'll give you all my contacts and you take over what's left of the lease for the next three months and build your own business. You know, I want you to take your time, think about this and get back to me tomorrow. So that was my first discovery into entrepreneurship. It was kind of like sink or swim. Um, there. And I dove right in. I took, I took the opportunity. I figured, why not? What do I have to lose? And it was a great learning experience working in the retail business. It was cell phone and pagers at that time. And this was, God, I don't even remember the year, but I was, I was 20, I'm 42 now. So I was about 20, 22, 23 years old, so about 20 years ago. And through that experience, there were a lot of valuable learning lessons. You know, operating your first business early on with no internet at that time. There was very little internet. There was no social media. Uh, you learned very quickly the things you need in business and how to survive and how to thrive. Sales, marketing, uh, accounting, all these little things that I believe get overlooked today. You know, mm -hmm. I believe it's about image, so to speak. It's like your social media and how well, you know, you look like you're doing well. Um but at that, at that time, there was none of that. So you literally had to have the basics down packed. And I'll, I'll kind of speed forward this fast. Uh, at that time, the industry started to shift. And these big stores or these big brands started to realize, well, we can do our own thing. Sprint, Verizon, T-Mobile. Uh, I believe at the time, Singular was in the market. Um, and they realized, well, why don't we just open up our own retail stores? 
And so I saw that and I saw the competition. It just became very, very competitive. You can't, could not compete with them on their level. Um, and so I decided to sell. Mm. And in that sell, uh, it was my first failure in entrepreneurship, but it was a big win for me at the same time. Mm. Can you share a little bit about that? How do you perceive it and what happened? Well, I look at it as a failure as I didn't reach the goals that I had, right? I wanted to own about 10 of these stores. I wanted to be making a certain amount of dollar amounts and I wanted to hire a certain amount of people. I didn't reach those goals. I, mm. own, I was only able to open up two. Uh, they were never really profitable. I was always chasing uh, always chasing revenue. Although we would have good spurts, uh, it wasn't coming in the droves that it was coming in when I was an employee. There was obviously a lot of bumps and about bumps and bruises there that, you know, my, my former employer had masked me from, so to speak. Uh, but you learn these lessons on your own. However, it was a huge win because I took these lessons and I learned them. And I said this, I remember saying specifically, this won't be the last time I own something. And so that was my journey into the next phase. Mm, beautiful. Um, in in, uh, in uh, short ideas, in between uh, that uh, ending of entrepreneurship till the next start, uh, what happened in between? What were you doing? So at that time, I, I, uh, I started doing fitness as a hobby. And I loved it. I completely changed my body. Um, at the time of about 19 to 20 years old, I had a daughter, very young, very, very young age for, for someone to have a child. And I didn't take care of myself anymore. I was an athlete my whole life. I prided myself on sports and athletics. But throughout, you know, once high school ended um, and the beginning of college, I partied. I mean, I partied hard. Like a normal teenager going into their early 20s. I had a good time, but my habits were completely terrible. My eating habits were terrible. Uh, I started smoking, drinking a lot, started partying, hanging out. And my, it took a toll on my body and obviously took a toll on my confidence and my psyche. Uh, so I took up fitness as a hobby. Just once my daughter was born, I realized I needed to change my life. And I loved it. I love the confidence it gave me. I love just how the clarity I, I was able to obtain. And funny enough, I tried to become a fire, a fireman. Mm -hmm. I wanted to join the fire department. FDNY was very, very popular. This was right after 9-11. Everyone loved firemen. And I was like, this is a great job. I failed the test, the physical test. I failed the physical test. And that's when I knew I needed to go all in on my fitness. And I started mm -hmm. to search more about it. And that led me into the next phase, which was fitness. Mm -hmm. And it, it was a chance meeting. I knew I wanted to get in. I didn't know how to. And I was, I, I decided to do a summer, a summer house with a bunch of friends. And my roommate at the time actually just so happened to be a manager at a large corporate fitness gym in New York, in, in New York. And we just got to talking. He learned all about my sales background and he, you know, obviously saw how, um, excited I was about fitness and how big and passionate I was about it. Well, he offered me his assistant role right then and there over beers on the weekend. And I interviewed and that was my first venture into fitness. Mm -hmm. ah, excuse me. So from there, I, I started running corporate fitness gyms and that was fantastic because that was my first, uh, my first dipping my foot into the corporate world before then I never, I was never in a corporate setting, uh, so to speak. It was always working with mom and pop stores. And so I got an opportunity to work in corporate, you know, you learn so many things about the politics of corporate, uh, of corporate America. You learn about, uh, how to deal with people on a very high professional level. And what was great is, the amount of education that they would give us, they would supply a good amount of education. They wanted us to become better. And not only with the fitness knowledge, but the business acumen, the sales, the marketing. I remember specifically taking a course on how to have fierce conversations. <laughs> and that was just 
I was a manager, so I needed to learn how to hire and fire people or how to be able to deliver feedback, but on a professional level. And I loved it. Uh, I was doing very well because of my sales background. I was able to hit the ground running and uh, get promoted twice within a very short amount of time. However, I also didn't like being bossed around. I didn't like the really long hours. I didn't like the, uh, the, the, the constant work and the constant grind that it was uh, or that it, it became, so to speak. And I also knew that I wanted to focus more on the fitness side of things because they were making the business side unenjoyable. Mm. It was a constant, uh, didn't care about people, more so cared about the numbers. And that was the first time I've ever learned that side of things. And I wanted, to, I wanted a different approach. So I left. And I just started doing personal training on my own. And lo and behold, a buddy of mine was getting ready to open up his own place. Asked me to come on board. Didn't, he didn't have much of a management background. He was just a trainer. Knew I had this entrepreneur background, this management background, could help him run the back end of things. And so we decided to partner up. And that was the next time I decided to go into the entrepreneur world and open my own space. Super. And uh, where did that lead you to? That is a <laughs> that led me to a long journey in fitness. I spent 17 years in the fitness industry. Mm. And I opened up that gym, um, opened up a couple of different boot camps. Uh, however, because of uh, a massive hurricane that hit New York at that time, Hurricane Sandy, it ended up bringing me back into Manhattan. It ended up pulling me back into corporate fitness, um, you know, and I jumped back into corporate fitness. I left the gym. Um, and it, that was was this, it was the period. second transition, second transition yes. from entrepreneurship to corporate America. Yeah. So, on, so let me backtrack there. Um, that was my second failure. Mm. That was my second failure. We were struggling way before um, the hurricane hit. We were, we were not getting along. This was a, a great experience into partnership. And he was my, we were best friends. We were roommates, but we were also business partners. And you learn a lot about someone when there's money on the line. You learn a lot about people when uh, you have to make these hard decisions. And we did not get along and we did not have the same vision. And that's very important for partners. You have to sit down and clarify what is each of your visions without bias? And then be able to see if it matches up. And we didn't do that. We were just young kids. We were about 26 years old and we were excited. And we, we, we were like, well, let's just go do it. We thought it would be easy. We had the clientele and we jumped in, but we didn't clarify our mission. We didn't clarify our values. We certainly didn't talk about our, our greater visions for what the business could potentially be. Mm. And when that doesn't happen, the honeymoon runs out very quickly. <laughs> it runs out very quickly, especially at the first sign of any kind of uh, adversity. You know, if you have a mission, you have your values, you understand your vision, when adversity comes, it's going to help you to get through it. And we argued a lot. We, we fought a lot. Uh, we separated our living situation thinking it would get better. Um, and it only got worse because it only basically, at that point, we just alienated one another. We saw, mm -hmm. we saw the industry going in two different ways. Um, and so that was my first failure, uh, my second failure, sorry. Mm. 
Um, diving into um, the thing that you said from the first experience and this one, here you've mentioned a, an important part that I believe for many listeners um, is a critical one. Uh, when we're going into partnerships, in many cases, we just so ignore the part where we have to align with the vision, with the values and with the mission that it's uh, either we perceive it as something that will happen eventually and uh, everything will work out because like it's it's all about money currently or is the other way around where you're scared to touch it because you don't know how it will work out but you really want it to be uh, in a certain way and uh, in terms of the communication issues the other thing that you mentioned is that uh, in the first part you overlooked uh, and people are overlooking a lot of foundational things uh, in the business can we touch a little bit of uh, the idea in both of those spheres? Uh, what do you believe is mostly overlooked when people start their business or start scaling it? Oh, that's a great point. The number one, themselves. What does that mean? So, so themselves. What are their current habits? What are their current mindset around what they're doing in their daily lives? Um, we are the business, right? Our business is only going to go, but as far as we go. So I think people kind of put the business first because they're so excited and they're so passionate, but they leave all their other things behind. They leave their habits. They leave their, uh, their, their ability to continue to grow and develop themselves. So number one is get yourself right as an entrepreneur, right? We'll focus on you, focus on your foundational pieces, your daily habits, and your belief systems. As you move into the business, you have to clearly define where you're going. And that is your mission. What are you doing? Who are you helping? But more importantly, how and why? How are you helping them? And why are you helping them? This is going to give you the juice that you need later when all the adversity hits, because there's no one I've ever met that has built a six or seven figure business that has never had any kind of adversity. This is the foundational piece. This is the number one thing, your mission, your vision, and your values. Once you have that set, and it's, it, it's something that you're always going to be looking at. It's something that's always going to possibly change as you change. I'm not the same person I was five years ago. My business and my mission has altered. It's gotten bigger. And that's what will continue to happen. Second thing, depending on what industry you're in, discover your niche. When you discover your niche, don't overlook the market research. In fact, get real comfortable with consistently doing your market research. I do market research all the time. It could be from a basic conversation to intentionally going out there and interviewing people. Uh, so it client, using... client uh, it says market research, not, not about uh, the competitor's side of things, but talking to the client themselves, right? Yes, great, great point. Thank you for that. Uh, talking to the actual people that fall underneath your niche or ideal clients. Getting a chance to understand the market better. What do they want? What do they desire? But go, go, go inside, go deeper. You know, you're going to get surface level answers, especially in the fitness realm. We'll, you know, you'll ask people like, oh, what do you want to do? Well, I, I, I want to be successful. Okay, great. Define that success for me. And why is that important to you? Right. And so you start to gain deeper. Uh, once you have the market research, you want to keep that somewhere where you can consistently be able to tap into it, whether it's a Google document, uh, but something that's accessible. Don't just do it uh, and just keep it in a book somewhere. I like to record all my conversations as well uh, so that I can always go back and listen to them and, and look at the person's mannerisms and see how they light up when they talk about certain, certain subjects. Another thing is an accountant or someone to count your money. <laughs> This is very important and I'm putting it in very layman's terms, but it's so critical to make sure that you have someone there 
to mind your finances. You yourself, as the business person, as the entrepreneur, as the owner, as an investor, you should always know your number one number, which is your overhead. That is your number one number you should know. What is my overhead? Mm -hmm. And then from there, you can start. Once you have that foundation, now you can start to stack on top of that foundation. It's like building a building, right? A, a quick question for, for those people who are listening and are not so business savvy. Uh, what's an overhead cost for the business? That is all of your, let's just put it very simply. That is all your bills, all your bills, all your expenses, and make sure you include your life expenses in that too, especially if you're a solopreneur or someone that is just starting up a new venture. Don't forget that you also have overhead in your personal life. So include either your rent or your mortgage, include your groceries, include your daily expenses, but also make sure you know the business expenses as well. A quick question here. It fits right in line. Uh, many entrepreneurs that start their business, um, they fall under uh, the sin of perceiving the business pocket as their own pocket. And uh, the money that is flowing in into the business, they perceive it as their own money. And uh, several conversations back, um, I've encountered there also uh, uh, that the idea is that we are not only including the the expenses into the overhead costs, but we are actually have to plan that we need to have a salary and we take no more than that salary out of the business. Can you expand on that a little bit as well? Yeah, that's a great point. Great point, especially for the solopreneur, especially for the person that's, you know, just maybe moving in or venturing into the online space on their own. It all depends on where you are. Um, here, in, I'm in Texas now. Uh, I set up the business a certain way. And through that way I set it up, I'm an employee in my own business and I take a salary. And that salary is basically right now only at 50% of my revenue. And someone may say like, oh my God, like, like how do you live on that? Well, it's important that one, you budget. Two, that's why you should know your, your overhead and you should know your numbers so that you can understand how to manage your life through those expenses. Uh, but it's important that the business itself grows. It's important that the money stays in the business so that I can use it to continue to grow the, the, the business. Mm. It takes money to make money. And at some point, you're going to want to hire a virtual assistant. You're going to want to spend on maybe some sort of marketing cost maybe editing some sort of uh, videos or, or your graphic content. You're going to pay your accountant. You're going to have expenses. And so the business should always be growing just as much as you're growing. It's also great for tax purposes. You know, again, depending on where you are, everybody has uh, different tax brackets and the way each country manages their taxes. But here, the way I handle it is... I'm an employee, I take 50%. Now I'm taxed on that 50% as an individual. The business is accountable for its 50%. So that allows me the ability to grow my finances a little bit better mm. in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Got you. And uh, as, as you've been uh, talking about the idea, right, the foundation is about knowing yourself and working on your mindset, on your habits, on your behavior. Then we dive into the vision, mission, and values as the core foundation. And in that part, I would like to ask a question as well. I believe for many, um, they perceive those ideas of values, mission, and, val and uh, vision as something really abstract, something really vague, and in many, in many cases, like, uh, you know, fluffy. In, in a sense yes. that no, no, no physical attachment to it that we love to have that monetary f attachment. Like I know what the hell it is. We cannot ever feel it, but uh, it's a big driver. How do you make it practical for yourself so that you are aligned with those things and they are like in your soul? Fantastic point. Yeah. You know, it could sound woo woo, 
But that's where you have to get really specific. Your mission should be greater than you. Your mission should be big. It should be the number one thing that I always have people do is they write it as it's already happened. Be specific, have measurable, have measurables and uh, specificities in there. So for one, my mission is to make sure I help over 5,000 entrepreneurs build six and seven figure businesses and be able to create communities. Uh, I'm sorry, their dream communities. That's a big number, right? That's a big number, but that pulls me now. Now that pulls me and it's not just woo. -woo, It's not spiritual. It's also very measurable. So every day I know that greater number lies ahead and I just chip away. Okay. I helped one today. I helped two today. I helped three today. And it just continues to grow on. Now your values, your values are very tangible, but they're also something you're going to live up to. That's very important. People think, what are your values? Oh, integrity. Well, what does that mean? Right? What is that? What does that really mean? Make it in a way that it means something to you. That I will always tell the truth, even when it doesn't help me. That's hard. That's really hard to do, right? Because you're going to be faced with times where lying may be, may seem like the best solution because it's mm-hmm. probably the truth may cause you to fail. It may cause you to lose relationships. It may cause you to lose money. But guess what? In the end, that is your value. You know it's important to you. You know the truth is more important than the money. The truth is more important than maybe a surface level relationship. And so you live up to that value, even when it's hard. So it causes you to think beyond who you currently are and makes you become someone who you want to be. Mm. And now your vision, very similar to your values, your vision can get a little woo-woo. It should be unrealistic. However, it should get real clear. And something that I, that I do it daily, I do, I do uh, vision exercises daily, is I like to imagine myself in certain situations. And what am I wearing? What do I see? Who's with me? What do I smell? What do I hear? And not only do I think about it, but sometimes I write it. And I write it in a way that it's either currently happening or it's already happened. And Mm -hmm. you can say all you want, oh, it's the law of attraction. Yeah, maybe it is, but it's also there's science behind this. There's science for the brain. Right. If the brain can see it, well, it's gonna re, it's gonna want to replay this again. It can, the brain can. It's very hard for the brain to try to accomplish things it cannot see. And so, if you do this on a daily basis, you actually start to create this uh, strategy for the brain so that it can try to acquire what you've brought into your life. So that's how I make it very measurable and specific, and not to woo-woo, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Uh, that reminded me of, uh, in the previous episode, I was uh, talking with uh, Lynn Power, and uh, she she mentioned uh, there's a model called PBEC. And mm-hmm. basically, it looks at vision uh, and values, most importantly, values, and how each of the values that we list in our business, how does it manifest in our community? So uh, how, like, for example, as you said, um, um, like, for example, integrity, right? How does integrity translate and live through in our community? What does it mean to have integrity in the community that we are building? Uh, What does it mean uh, to have integrity in the behavior? What does it mean to have integrity in the environment, right? So we physically attach each value to how does it express itself in our surrounding. And then each value that we imprint into our business, into our core beliefs, becomes something tangible and connected because it's not just a word now. 
but it's actually a word that is expressed in a certain behavioral pattern and a meaning in something that surrounds us in what and what we are building. So that's an interesting uh, addition to what you just yeah. said. I mean, that just holds you accountable, right? That really makes you accountable to come up more than just the word, right? To say, how does this, okay, this is the word, but like you said, what is the meaning behind this and how does it serve the community? Mm -hmm. That's great. That's fantastic. Yeah. And um, uh, also, so we've touched on business, right? The niching, uh, the client conversations to study and research what the client truly needs, wants, desires, fears. So get that out of them and put that in the foundation of the business. Uh, you talked about uh, count counting the money, count especially the overhead, understanding where your money flowing out. Um, then you talked about hiring, outsourcing. Is there anything else that you believe can be overlooked uh, in business currently? Lead generation, marketing, Super. you know. Something that I was told and I, was, I learned very early on is sell every day. Mm -hmm. And when you sell every day, you're basically, when you're providing value, you're selling and when you're selling, you're providing value. And you're doing this on a daily basis. Wait, maybe it's indirectly, maybe it's directly, right? But you're providing value to the market every day. That's selling, right? You're intentionally selling because we all know that the best customers come from already happy customers right? Referrals are a fantastic way to grow your business. It's one of the least expensive ways <laughs> to grow your business, right? And, but they, it's so, it's so much easier when someone comes to you excited to work with you because they've already have this initial per, uh, perception of the value given someone they've already known. And so they, they walk into it excited. They walk into the, uh, these, these expectations of you being able to help them. Um, so referrals, you know, lead, consistent lead generation. Uh, I spend an hour a day Super. doing lead generation. That's practical. Uh, can, can you give any, any hints on what, is, uh, what patterns or what kind of strategy do you follow during that hour? Yes. So I spend, I, I spend 10 minutes I'm sorry, I, I reached out to 10 people. Uh, the first 10 people are trying to schedule some sort of interviews, whether it's a podcast, whether it's a YouTube channel, whether it's an IG Live, whether it's a Facebook Live. But I, I reach out and I try to schedule at least 10 interviews. Or so 10 for meetings. you to speak or for you to interview? Both. So a combination of both. From there... I move on and I go and engage with 10 mentors or high influencers in the market space, people that I look up towards, people that have great accounts, you know, whether it's like an Ed Milet or Tony Robbins or, um, you know, other business coaches that are in the market space. And I engage with them. I engage with their audience on, you know, whether it's a comment thread or something like that. I engage with them. Uh, can you can you provide some hints on uh, what does that engagement uh, mean, or how does it uh, translate into practical uh, actions? So let's say your your favorite influencer or your favorite uh, personality out there uh, that you look up to puts up a post. Mm. We know that they're probably going to get thousands of views. So you want to give some sort of comment or takeaway on their post that you took away from that. What that does is that allows those thousands of eyeballs to see what you just wrote. And from those thousand eyeballs, someone's going to click on you. Someone's going to say, who's this person that just left this awesome comment? And don't just leave a comment with an emoji like, oh, that was awesome. Like leave something of value. Right. What was your perceived takeaway from that comment or from that uh, post that they put up there? And then from there, it shifts to I reach out to about 10 to 20 
potential customers. Mm. And, and it could be something as small as just saying, uh, hey, how's it, how's it going today? Uh, you know, just touching on the relationship, continuing to further along those relationships. Are they new? And that's very important. I'm sorry? Um, the, the 10 to 20 potential customers, uh, are they new people that you find or are they like already in your, uh, let's say, funnel or communication list? Both, which is a great point. That They're both, right? They're already people that may have come into my sphere, whether they maybe have commented on a post, they may have uh, liked a certain post that I put up there, uh, they may have been engaging with me through my stories, Um and so I'll continue to build that relationship, you know, and, and sometimes it's just, there's no sales happening. There's no business happening. It could just be me saying, Hey, hope you have a great day. And just touching them so that one, they see I'm a human being, right? I'm not a bot. I'm not some person. I'm not, I'm not some person they can't touch or talk to. Um, but it's also furthering that relationship and it's trying to move them down the line into what's the next step for them to get into my funnel you know mm -hmm. is it hey have they have they gotten my free giveaway have they maybe taken advantage of one of my free workshops um so it's very important that you spend an, a minimum of an hour a day trying to touch different areas of the business that can help you to move it along got you um did i understand correctly so the people who you reach out to the potential customers are mainly those people who engaged with your content already not something that you find in in some other groups people who you reach out to but it's specifically people who uh, liked commented or somehow interacted with the content that you already created yes it's organic i like organic um i tried the don't know you DM strategies that there is out there, right? Uh, I've tried that and it didn't feel natural for me. Mm -hmm. It didn't feel organic, so to speak, right? So this person that is engaging with me, they've already seen a little bit of value, right? They, they, something, something stuck with them. So it, it's easier for me now to nurture that relationship uh, versus just going into a total stranger who doesn't know me who's probably been bombarded already with three to five, you know, DMs a day, mm -hmm. right? Because that's the, that's the market today. Um, so I love doing it organically. That works for me. Super. That's, that's a great advice. And uh, also I was speaking with Frank King. He also said that is one of the foundational things that he does on a daily basis. If someone likes comments or reaches out to him, he always sends an appreciation message to them that he's seen it and he's uh, thankful and gets into that relationship building. So you, you also shared that strategy. And I believe that many um, are not doing it at all. Like they're yeah. just appreciating and maybe having that inner uh, inner lift in them. That oh wow, I'm do I am getting likes, I am getting noticed, but they don't take action upon that response and that reaction from people. And one of the valuable things we can do is even if they like it, just reach out to them and start a conversation of appreciating that they uh, they let's say uh, gave a boost to, yeah. to to what you've shared. And every like, every comment works for you. So basically what, what they do for that engagement is they provide value to you so that others can see it as well. So Absolutely. they basically just super supported what you're doing. And that small message of appreciation for what they've done uh, can go a long way for, for people. Yeah, it's a great opportunity also for you to show your personality. You know, I like to have fun with it. There are times where I won't even see anything. I'll just send a picture of me and my dog. You know, like if they like something, I'll just send a picture like. For real? <laughs> yeah. And, okay. you know, it, it's lighthearted. You know, it's lighthearted. And it, but it shows a different side of your personality. It shows mm. the human side of who you are a little bit. Wonderful. And look, you got to have fun. You got to make this stuff fun, right? If you just all business, all work, you're going to burn out fast. So you got to make it, you got to find little ways to always inject personality and make it fun. Mm, got you. Now, transferring uh, to the last part of, uh, of the conversation, in, in terms of um, building a partnership, and what would you say 
are the three fundamental things not to overlook, but pay strong attention to uh, during creating and building up a business partnership with someone? Number one is communication. You know, make sure you under, you have your ways that you're going to communicate. You know, how are you going to communicate? It's very important, not only in the communication, but how you're going to do it. Too many times where we're confused because we don't know how to reach out to someone. You know, I'm going to wait till I see them. Well, have it set on how you communicate. You know, I think technology does wonders for us these days. And so have your, have your procedures on how you're going to communicate. Very important, right? What days are you going to communicate on? This way you're setting up boundaries as well. You know, nobody likes a 12, p, a 12 a.m. text message in the night or an email that comes in uh, randomly, right? So have the times and the days and the ways you're going to communicate. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that you mentioned the idea of, uh, of boundaries. And uh, for many people, they have a really unhealthy relationship with the thing that they call boundaries. But mm -hmm. I believe what you just shared is uh, a matter of mutual respect and respect for your own time in the first place. And uh, also that goes in line with the values that you have in life to make sure that your partner has the same values as you do. And if they value being accessible 24 seven and you don't, you have to mention that in the beginning because either uh, you will uh, get into a rhythm where you're living a frustrated life because they are disrespecting the way that you value things to be. Uh, or you will get into a position where uh, you will again and again and again hit that wall of where, dude, it's not the right time. Call me tomorrow. And he's like, I need you now. And you get into that fight of, uh, of uh, realities and end up breaking up because in the beginning, you didn't set the agreement of what is your way of communication. That's a wonderful, wonderful point there. Thank you. You you put it you put it so well actually. <laughs> All right, but it's so, so true. It's so true to set that up. Um, and the second thing now uh, is making sure that I, I had my point here. I almost forgot. Um, boundaries, uh, communication. Kind of lost my thought there. But, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. I love these conversations because you take what I said and you just you you, you gave some perception to it, which is awesome. Um, Oh, okay. I know where I was going with this. Sorry. So the second thing is making sure that um, you're lined up correctly. You know, mm -hmm. um, you're lined up with what are the things that you both want in the business. Very important, you know. But not only that, how do you both work? This is what I meant to say. This is the point. It took me a while to get there. Mm -hmm. The second thing, when, when you're making with a partner, your chances are you're becoming partners because you're going to complement each other. So you're going to be strong and weak in different areas, and you should complement each other. So that should be intentional with who you choose to partner with. Super. Doesn't make sense. And I learned this very early. Doesn't make sense to partner up with someone who does the same thing I do. Right. We're just going to be really good at this one thing then. Right. And we end up actually just kind of stepping on each other's toes. So it's good people who can do things you can't. And you pick each other up. So it's very important as the second thing that you under you, you bring these things out. You talk about them. Hey, what are you good at? What are you weak at? What do you want to do? What do, what do you want to what do you not want to do? And so you're very aligned up with how you're going to work together. Mm. So it's, uh, it's the idea that the second part is the idea of roles and responsibilities within the company framework that everyone has to know what they are responsible for. They take responsibility for that. You hold them accountable to what they do and they do the same thing for you. And that's where you both are building up a thing uh, that uh, is supplementing each other. Absolutely, for sure. Mm -hmm. All right. And you know, you, you touch a great point with expectations. 
a great thing you should always ask, whether it's a customer, whether it's a, a, a partner, whether it's a, a, a you know, a, a, a significant other. How do you like to be held accountable? How do you like to be spoken to? Mm. We all like to be coached and, and spoken to in different ways, right? So for me, I, I like conversation, right? I like if I'm doing something wrong, let's have a conversation about it and be upfront. I like that. Some people may shy away from that. Others may like more rah-rah may more like more discipline, more in your face, more like go, you know, let's push almost like that football mentality. Um, so it's very important to make sure that, hey, how do you like to be coached? How do you like to be held accountable? How do, how do we work out our problems together? Mm -hmm. So I think understanding of one another, of, of how you like to be approached and how you approach things is very critical. That's a wonderful point. That's uh, actually, this is something that um, uh, I'm really deep into personality typing. And uh, one of the foundational things, as, as you mentioned, I, I also see it throughout in business relationships that the main thing that suffers and why the majority of businesses uh, break apart is the lack of mutual understanding and communication between the partners. And uh, Personality typing, especially uh, taking into account uh, what I most love out of uh, them all is the Enneagram. Uh, it looks specifically at the unconscious patterns of behavior and communication and mental processes of each of the partners so that you actually step out of the idea that how do we usually perceive life is that the other person should think uh, should feel and should act the same way as we do we, because we perceive that we are the right ones, yes. that we do the correct right. way, that right. our way of thinking, of feeling, of acting is the right way of doing things. And then we encounter again and again that there are so many people out there that are doing things wrong, not the way that we believe that is right to do. And uh, the most wonderful thing that when we come across such tools as the Enneagram, we actually start seeing why the hell other people are living a different life. Why mm -hmm. are they thinking and perceiving life differently? Why their emotional and behavioral patterns are different to what I am expecting from them? And uh, this is where we, uh, we are able to step back from how do we perceive the right way is we start understanding where other people come from and then we start building that empathy and compassion muscle because that's a muscle we need to train so that we start perceiving other people and especially our partners and as you said of course our significant others that we start understanding that they come and see life from their own perspective through their lens of their experience so it's a subjective worldview that we need to learn to understand and uh, through using such tools as uh, the Enneagram to understand the personality type of both of the partners, you open up that magnificent opportunity to understand what are the expectations, what are the work habits, uh, what are the communication styles, how to work with conflict, how to work with feedback. And all the things that you just mentioned are uh, easily uh, can be like pinpoint and talked through uh, it, through those personality typing systems as the Enneagram. So uh, you've mentioned exactly on point every single thing that are really huge fuck-ups in many relationships, uh, especially the business ones. Just because I fucked up a lot of relationships. <laughs> you know, uh, I've learned the hard way. So, you know, it, I wish I had these personality tests early. You know, I wish I had access to them or I knew about them. Um, or, you know what? That's not true. I wish I valued them mm. more. You know, I was introduced to them early, but I just didn't value them. I didn't understand how important they really are until I got a little older and I was like, whoa, I, that's me. <laughs> that's mm. me in a nutshell. That's what I do. I, how did you know that? Um, so it's, it, it, it's such a great tool. Don't overlook these things. You Can know, you share a, a little bit on that point? Um, yeah. uh, what uh, what systems did you uh, touch 
and what which one of those did you find the most value in maybe or not value because they all drive their own specific value but what was the most uh, let's say awareness boosting one i, I believe it was disc mm -hmm. right it was disc and i did disc a few about about a year two years ago now i uh, signed on with uh, tony robbins a life coaching program and I, I wanted to be coached. You know, I knew I wanted, uh, you know, to work with a, a high level coach. And so they, they do that personality test for you. And what's great is they do it before the sales process, actually. So before you get on a sales call, the salesperson already knows who he's dealing with or he or he or she is dealing with. And so it makes them, it makes it very easy for them. But I was going through a time where I was going through a lot of transition in my own life and a lot of growth. So when they were talking about these points, I was in a place where I was ready for the information. Mm. I was ready to be told that um, I'm very impulsive. I was ready to be told uh, that there are things that I did that were in my unconscious mind. And these are the reasons why I did them. Mm. And it's like, I was ready for that information. Whereas sometimes we're not, we're not ready to accept that. Mm -hmm. And so through, through that um, uh, through those six months of coaching, I was able to understand how I did things better. I was able to understand why I was strong in certain areas and why, not that I was weak, but these are just not part of my personality. And can you train them? Can you fix them? Sure. But what I found sometimes, it's better to outsource some of that. Mm -hmm. It's just faster. It's easier. It's smoother to just say, okay, here are the areas where I know there's going to be a lot of resistance. And sure, you can train them and you can get better with them. Absolutely. You should a little bit, but sometimes you just need to go mm -hmm. and it's okay to just bring in that first person or outsource that little thing that can help you to move faster. Beautiful. Uh, I, I believe for many listeners here, this is a great example uh, and a good touch point. And uh, I believe I believe that DISC uh, can be a very, uh, yet it's, uh, it's simple in a way, because mm -hmm. it looks at four dimensions of the personality, though the value that you can derive from that tool uh, is uh, it can be really shifting for anyone who didn't come across such systems before. And it, it can, as uh, for example, James uh, brought up here, uh, change uh, and it opens you up. It allows you to see what is happening in you. And then you can actually make a conscious decision. Do you accept that effect on your life? or you want to direct it in another way. And then you start the transformation process where you change your habits, you change your mental processes, and you eventually, uh, as, as you said, right? I also don't like to perceive things that, uh, okay, there are our talents and strengths, what we should focus on, what we should build on. And then there are not weaknesses. I, I also don't like naming them weaknesses. I love to name them growth zones. Those are zones that are impacting our life, uh, especially when we're living unconsciously. And uh, we are not seeing them. They negatively influence our decisions, our relationships, our business, and everything else. But a growth zone is, is a thing where you are able to consciously see it, and then you're able to put in the work where they stop negatively influencing our life. And that's where you can get them to, and then your life can be fully focused on your, on your strengths and talents. And everything else where, uh, where you know, you had your growth zones, introduce partners that will uplift you with their strengths in that area. And you will add to them your talents and your strengths in the, where, in the areas where their grown growth zones lie. And that's where you build out that relationship where you are complementing each other's strengths and each other's growth zones. Absolutely. You know, to be... To go very layman's terms, right? Very simple put, there's always going to be somebody that has that bigger picture vision, right? What's the bigger? Can they see the bigger picture? But that person that often can see the bigger picture doesn't really have, you know, it was me, was the discipline to see the small steps each and every day, to do the little details work. And so if you're a big picture person, 
that's your cue to maybe try to get on with someone that can do the opposite, mm -hmm. that can see the small details, that can take the small steps, that can look at something and work within it while you're focusing on the greater, the, 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 that, those greater, bigger picture items. Really well said. Now, let's continue from transitioning. We stopped at the point where you had your second fuck up, you, ret you returned to the corporate America. What happened next? I returned to corporate America and quickly realized why I left in the first place. <laughs> uh, it got even worse, right? It got even worse. Um, the, the customer was no longer a focal point. It was completely numbers driven, right? We're fitness. We're, we're, we're fitness was supposed to be about changing people's lives, impacting lives. They didn't even care. And I remember having a manager who, a uh, very aggressive person, very aggressive personality. And at that time, I was going through a transition where I was reading more, I was doing more growth and personal development. So I started to see things differently. And I knew this is not the way I wanted to operate anymore, right? I knew it. And I felt something else pulling me. But I also didn't want to open up any more businesses. That my second fuck up was like, nope, that's it. I'm done. Mm. And so I kind of took some time off. I went on a journey. I quit the job. Um, I decided to go to California for two weeks. I went, I got a CrossFit certification and I just hung out there for two weeks and just chilled out on the beach, just took a, took a break. But in doing so, I made new friendships and new relationships out there. And one of the relationships ended up turning into what would be my next job. Mm -hmm. And I just called them back and I thanked them for, you know, going out to uh, dinner. We had such a great time. I wanted to thank you so much. And this person was like, oh, no problem, man. It's great to meet you. Oh, by the way, a friend of mine just opened up a new gym and they're, they're looking for good quality people. Give them a call. I don't know about you, but the universe just works in mysterious ways, right? I put myself in that position. And sometimes you need to take a step back. If you're struggling, if you're going through some sort of uh, transition, especially this year, right? 2020 was that craziest year for us. Sometimes it's okay to take a back step. It's okay. <sighs> Catch my breath. Where do I want to go? What's going to come next? And just take a moment. And because of that, I was able to find my next step. And I went, I went back to New York and I started working for a mom and pop gym um, who had become my mentor, Eric Froelich, fantastic gentleman, uh, very hard on me, but I needed that at that time. Um, and I helped him. We, we, we took a struggling gym in New York City. We had like 70 members and we became the strongest community. We opened up a second location and then they turned that into a franchise model uh, for another fitness entity. They took the earnings and the revenue that we were making, we were doing so well, and they went on to open up a new franchise, which is phenomenal. I'm very proud of them uh, for doing that. Um, and we did that for, we were together for about two to three years where I felt the calling again. Uh, I was burning out also. I was, I was working, I was managing multiple gyms. I was living a very fun social life in New York City. <laughs> um, and I was doing all of these different events. I was doing it all. And I knew this wasn't, this was, okay, I, I was done here. I did all that I can do. What's next? And so I pulled the trigger and I decided to travel. Again, I went, across, I went overseas and I started working with a company that was bringing fitness to the Middle East. And through that experience, uh, that experience allowed me to get back into mentorship of coaches. Whereas before I was, although I was mentoring, it was all about me. I was still the young in the mind. I was still very egocentric. Moving to Kuwait allowed me to not be the guy anymore. I didn't have to be the person. I can now put my focus in mentoring these young, inexperienced coaches. Um, and, and that's, all, uh, that's uh, to clarify, not coaches as uh, uh, professionals in uh, setting goals and everything else, but as uh, fitness coaches, yep. right? Fitness coaches, CrossFit coaches, strength mm -hmm. and conditioning coaches. Mm -hmm. And that was a tremendous experience because you're just growing relationships. You know, you're growing relationships. And 
I have these, I have these international relationships to this day, right? To this day, I can, I still have a, a, a big grasp on, on the Middle East market. Um, but I was out there for about a year and a half and came back. And that was when I was like, I had the entrepreneur bug. It's time again. It's time. I didn't want to do it in New York. I moved to Texas. I saw the market in Texas, un, you know, unfolding. I'm like, this is going to be the place everybody wants to go to. This was four years ago. And lo and behold, I don't know why. I do know why, but I failed at opening up a brick and motor. It just wasn't happening. We couldn't raise the capital. Uh, I didn't get a lot. Like the, the, I didn't do those things that we talked about with partnerships. Mm-hmm. I wasn't doing all of them. I wasn't making sure that we were communicating right. I wasn't making sure that our vision was lined up. Not intentional, but I started to see that it wasn't. And I'd already had partnerships before. So I saw the writing on the wall and we decided not to go forward with this venture. That led me to then explore the online space Mm. and to see, well, if I'm not going to work in a brick and mortar, I know that there's something, I can have a greater impact. I don't want to just work in four walls and just be committed to this four wall space. I know there's a greater opportunity out there. And so that led me to pursue the online space. Mm. Okay. And what did that fold uh, out into? So I started to dive and dip my toe into the life coaching space. And we talked about this earlier before we got on the call. It was fantastic. I was working with people outside of my industry. Uh, I was working with graphic designers, people in tech, people in finance. And they were all wonderful people and they were all awesome. Um, And, you know, we were working on their habits, their routines, you know, their goals. But the traumas, the childhood traumas started to become uncovered. And I was not comfortable in that realm. It was way out of my expertise, number one. And two, I didn't feel comfortable taking that on. You know, I'm the type of person that takes on other people's energy. I absorb it, right? So when I'm absorbing those energies all day, I didn't know, I didn't have the tools of my own to be able to deal with them. Mm -hmm. And so very quickly I said, okay, this is not something I wanted to do. That's when I started getting numerous coaches. I started working with coaches to understand where am I going? Mm -hmm. Um, And I gained the clarity to realize that the business that I wanted to do has been in front of me the entire time. What's that? It just, and that was mentoring and helping other coaches. Mm. That was mentoring and helping other coaches. It was, it was there the whole time. It had presented itself for many years. I remember 10 years ago, before I quit my, before I left the, my number two, my, my second business venture, I had the opportunity to invest in a program with uh, Sam Bakashaw. Rest in peace. He just passed away. Um, and I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. He had a super trainer program. And it was all virtual, it was all online. And it, the teacher appeared, but the student wasn't ready. Mm. And it just kept, it, it would always show itself little by little in these little opportunities, but I wasn't ready and I wasn't ready. And finally, it kept knocking. And I was like, this is it. If I, if, I feel like if I don't take it this time, the universe is not going to present this thing anymore to me. <laughs> and so finally, I just decided... It was time to grow a pair. It was time to heal. It was time to gain the confidence that I could do this. Because I relied, too, I relied too much on 17 years of experience working in one area, which I was very comfortable in. But this was an area I was not very comfortable in. Mm-hmm. And so it was time to go there. What was the most supporting thing that helped you to make that transition, that jump? It was finally healing childhood traumas, but being able to connect the dots on why I did certain things, Mm. why I believed certain things. So growing up, uh, I had said earlier, my father moonlighted in organized crime and, you know, he lived this other life where, you know, he was a street guy and he had different uh, street businesses per se. So when I was a child, he would always, he would take me with him everywhere. And I saw everything. And he would always say, whatever you see, 
whatever you hear, never speak of, never share this. And more importantly, never tell your mother. <laughs> never tell your mother, but never share this. And so out of that, you know, love and respect, but also fear from my father, because basically what it was saying is we can get hurt. Something bad can happen to us if you speak about what you see. And whether it was violence, whether it was drugs, whether it was uh, my father uh, being adulterous and, and being with other women, all of it could have came back to hurting my family. And so when it came time to being an adult and sharing my heart, sharing my vision, sharing my values, sharing myself with the world, I was closed off to it. And I didn't know why. I didn't know why I just couldn't get past these certain things. Um, and it wasn't until uh, I discovered some plant medicine, uncovered certain memories that I had as a child. And those led me to seek out someone that can help me. And I found a Theta healer and she was fantastic. And we did a few, in just a few sessions, I was able to connect the dots for so many childhood memories, but more importantly, the emotions that I had today. Wait, that's a fear? Where's that fear coming from? Oh, okay, I understand. That's coming from this time that this thing happened with my uncle and blah, blah, blah. Okay. So I can detach, I was able to detach emotionally from it, see it, and then be able to reverse course. Mm. And so I think that, that alone gave me the confidence to be able to use all of these different things that I've gained in my life and use it as fuel versus it holding me back. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that story. And I believe that for many listeners, um, they can find themselves in a position where something is just not clicking. Something is just like you, you basically have a situation where you feel you have everything, like everything is in place, but it's just not clicking. Something is in the way. And your story is a great example where uh, you understand that you need to reach out and gain the support of the right person and through gaining that support, through working with the inside, with the past, because I believe in per se the idea that we are all children, but are just in in an adult body. Yes. In in the soul, we are still the same child. Like if if we think about it, we can uh, perceive ourselves with uh, mental perceptions that, oh, we're already adults, we, we're already like 40 or 50 or 30 years old, no matter. We, we put so many labels on what we should be and are, but we forget that all the experiences that we live through as children, they're still there. It's not like mm -hmm. there, there came a time where we became adults, like at 18, for someone is 21, uh, some have specific parties that symbolize the adult life. And then you think like, okay, uh, fuck childhood. And that's yeah. not me anymore. Uh, <laughs> and sure. uh, now I'm uh, growing up. Uh, but the thing is that uh, every time we make a new decision, we're building upon all the foundation that was laid in us in childhood. And yeah. if we don't work through those patterns and every single thing in our behavior, like the behavior, the emotional patterns, the mental processes, they're all found as a foundation in childhood. And in psychology, they look at the perception that the foundation is laid, the, the let's say the worldview foundation is laid until seven years old, plus minus. So by yeah. seven, we have a specific strategy of how we satisfy our core needs, and that's where every single behavioral and emotional patterns uh, and mental processes, like they built upon how do we learn to satisfy and get what we need. And in many cases, these strategies can be more or less healthy, thanks to the surrounding that we had, or they can be super destructive and unhealthy. And then mm -hmm. from the age of seven till 14, we develop the emotional intelligence muscle. And if during that time, we have super unhealthy environment, you're going to have a super unhealthy emotional uh, intelligence patterns. 
and if you think that when you grow up and you you are past that age and nothing will ever show up again you're totally wrong and your example is a beautiful example where you've noticed that and you were mad enough to look inside and understand that there is something that is holding you back from the past those experiences need to be worked through and you used tether healing to solve those issues to reposition reconstruct the the con emotional connections to those painful memories of the past and now that you've rewired them you were able to release those that tension that hold back and now live a more healthy life because those patterns were broken and you're you were able to build new ones yeah it's fascinating you know um you know especially for men right it could be a, a tough draw to go ask for help or go see a therapist right but when you get when you get down to it it was science you know i was working with the brain you know there are three aspects of the brain there's the, the unconscious the subconscious and then the conscious and when you realize that you're working Maybe I'm not in control here, you know, maybe, maybe there's something else at play here. And I was so fascinated with learning how to make the brain work for me. Mm. And so everything that you just said was on point and it just, I realized, okay, there's so much potential here. It's not woo woo. It's not you chanting in a corner somewhere. It is really scientific and there are actually tools and strategies that you can do that you can completely change the way you operate you can completely change your beliefs you can completely change who you are i think there's this thing that people say like well this is just how i am and you accept that and it's like you accept all your negative behaviors just because you think this is how you are well you can change those things very easily if you want to Definitely. And that goes in line, like for those who listen to the idea and do have that worldview, I can give you a scientific proof. There is this thing, Google it, it's called neuroplasticity. That's the only thing you need to know about your brain that will prove you wrong with the idea that you cannot change. Yeah. Neuroplasticity is the idea that the neurological patterns, so basically every time we do a specific action, a connection between neurons is formed. The more we repeat that action, the more connections are made and it, it forms a channel. And mm. uh, we are an electrical system. We, all our patterns, all our emotions are triggered by electrical impulses. And every time we hit a, a situation in our life, that's, that's a great thing that you said, that every time we are hit with a situation, our patterns will go in a way that's least resistance. Where's the least resistance? The bigger the channel, the less resistance because it's easily going through. And uh, therefore, building that consciousness, noticing that pattern and deciding to take a different action. That's where we go into the line of changing habits and how the, the change works. We actually are breaking apart. So every time when you make a conscious decision to take another action, that is not usual for you. You build a new neural connection. The more you practice it, the more you're strengthening that channel. And the same as with muscles. If you don't train a muscle, what happens to a muscle? It fades, right? It gets, it gets really weak. And the same thing happens with the neuron connections. The, the more we train the right pattern of behavior, the weaker becomes the other pattern that was who we thought we are or how we thought we are. And through time, it breaks apart where there's nothing left of that pattern. And the strong new channel is what you consciously decided to build. And through time, you did it. And that uh, that's goes in line with the idea that you just shared, that in many cases, people just believe that they are who they are, but they're not. No, 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 no. You know, neuroplasticity and learning all, more about that, you know, I became obsessed. Um, it led me to create what I call my unstoppable daily dozen. Mm, what's that? So 
the unstoppable daily dozen are these small little habits that you do every day that are going to help you to move your life and your business forward. Super. And they're very simple. They're very simple. And they, there are three things, in fact. They're productive, they're healthy, and they're simple. So I do six things in my life and six things in my business. And these 12 unstoppable daily practices, I know if I do these things for 30 days, everything's going to move forward. I do these for six months. I do these for a year. What is life and business going to look like? And they're very simple, right? So my life, it's very simple. It's journal, you know, wake. 6 a.m., journal, drink my water requirements, meditate, breath work, exercise for a minimum of 60 minutes per day, get sunshine, right? Those are very simple to do, right? And when I meditate, I journal, you know, I do my gratitude and my vision exercise in there. I don't write that, but those are very simple to do. You can do those every day. You can wake up, you can drink your water requirements, you can make your bed. You can, you can move your body for a minimum of 30 minutes, right? So what are the things, what are the six things in your life that you know you want to change, but you want to do simply every day? Then there's six things in my business. And I do them in a way that it becomes unconscious, the way you walk into a room and you turn on the light. I literally, next thing, as soon as I'm done with that final thing in my life, I move on to the business. A quick question. Well, a quick question. So those are six things that you do first thing in the morning, right? Yes. Super. So uh, the morning starts. So it's your morning ritual. You start with six things connected to improving your life quality. And then you move Correct. into six things that improve your business, business quality, business scale. And they're super. What's the business Correct. side? So the business side, immediately one hour lead generation. So it's the first thing I do in the business is one hour. I spend one hour lead generation. Why? Because it's the hardest thing. <laughs> no one wants to do it, right? No one wants to sit there and, and get outside of their comfort zone and start reaching out to people. But you know what? Do the hardest thing first. You know, so for me, it's lead generation. It could be creative work for other people. So maybe they reverse that. But immediately, one hour lead generation. Next thing, what's the most important part of the day? What's the most important priority that the business needs right then and there? Is it creating a lesson plan? Is it, you know, creating some sort of document? Is it creating some sort of piece of content? What is that thing? A, a quick one question the, here, a side question. note, is it's an important one. As you said, the most important thing, how do you make that decision? How do you prioritize the importance of the things that you need to do in business? What are my top priorities for the quarter? Mm, so you, you build what it the upon the, the quarterly goals. Quarterly goals as what is the yearly goals break down into quarterly goals. Quarterly goals get broken down by priorities. Mm. So I can know that I'm moving step-by-step step towards those quarterly goals. And these six things, if you're just starting out as an entrepreneur, depending on where you are in your business, they may change. But for someone that's just starting out or someone that's maybe, you know, maybe hovering around the 10,000 per month mark, right? Not quite at six figures. These six things you should be doing. So one, lead generation. Two, creating one video. Three, creating one piece of content. Four, checking your finances. You'd be surprised at how many people don't look at their finances every day. <laughs> Check your books. Five, check in with your customers. You don't have to check on all your customers, but take spread it out. I'm going to reach out to these five customers today. I'm going to reach out to these five customers. Check in on your customers. And then last, always check your planner. But more importantly, take ownership of your planner. Take ownership of your schedule. What does build that mean? Your, so basically, build your business around your life. Far too often, we create and we invite chaos because although we look at our schedule, we allow other people to do it. And we don't schedule the things that are important to us. And that's a whole nother thing. But in the beginning of anyone working with me, we go through a time and energy management process where we learn how to build our business around our life. So that means scheduling 
the most important things in your life first. Date night, family time, reading time, exercise time, meditation time. All those things that you often put off because the business should come first because you're so excited and passionate, those are the things that are going to help you to keep fulfilled. And those are the things that are going to help you to move your business forward. Wonderful. That leads me into a question of um, basically, um, first, let's touch upon the idea of uh, the ideal life scenario. Do you have one and how far ahead do you plan? Can you repeat that again? I'm sorry. Um, so the, the idea is uh, you, you've touched upon uh, the idea of quarterly and yearly goals. And my yes. question to you, do you have like an ideal life scenario to which you're heading and how far ahead do you plan? Five years. So I always plan out like five years. So I play the long game and I don't get caught up, you know, because we greatly overestimate what we can do in a year and greatly underestimate what we can do in 10. So I, I look at things in a five year, a five year view. Mm. Uh, so what are my five year main big rocks? What are the things I really want? And they should scare the hell out of me. They do. Mm -hmm. like, well, that, I don't know if I'm going to do that, but let's go. Um, and then from there, I break it down. You know, I break it down year by year. And I always reverse engineer. For me, reverse engineering is one of the best strategies I've ever learned. Start with the end in mind. And then work backwards. You know, I work backwards to my goals. Um, and I just make these little goals, uh, these small obtainable things. And that's why the daily dozen unstoppable was so important. What are the things that I can do every day that are going to help me to get to these bigger things? I also break them down into behavioral patterns and fives. So every quarter I have to do these five things. So it could be, I'm going to do jujitsu three days a week. I'm going to do yoga two days a week. Well, that's my physical body. I know for my physical health, uh, it's going to get me to, to whatever major physical goals I have. I'm going to do the, I'm going to break it down into these things, these strategies, do this three days a week, do this two days a week. I know if I do that for the next three months, yeah, I'm physically going to be good. Same thing in my, in, in, in my business. What are, what are the two to three things that I know I need to do weekly in order to get to my goals? Mm -hmm. It's basically what are the steps, right? What is the work? What is the actual process? Um, and when I do it that way, I enjoy it. I enjoy the process because I know I just have to do this thing, right? It's about make one video a week. I know if I make one video a week, one YouTube video a week, man, that's 52 videos at the end of the year. Uh, but right? you mentioned that uh, that's a daily dozen, right? That's, uh, uh, right. as you said, in business, you do a video a day. Now, do so I do, do a video a day and, you know, I'll upload it to Instagram stories or my Facebook stories or mm -hmm. something like that. But one major uh one major content piece mm. you know depending on what your what your what your goals are could be podcast right could be a podcast how many people don't start a podcast because they're thinking about show 50 before they've done show one mm. so it's like hey you want to do a podcast do one video per week that's it one video per week think about it like that just one a week and then start to build that muscle start to build that towards the greater goal Wonderful. And uh, connecting, uh, connecting the dots uh, between uh, long-term planning, uh, deconstructing, having quarterly goals, how do you plan out your week and what helps you to stay productive? As you said, journaling, can you dive deeper into that? So I do, I love my strategy session, my weekly strategy session. Weekly. It's, like, mm -hmm. it's my week, it's my favorite day of the week. Um, I do it on Sundays. Um, here in the States, we start our week on Monday. So I do it on Sundays and I make it a thing, you know, I make it a whole two hour about me, you know, I'll do a little meditation. So I get my mind ready. And then I break down what are my top priorities, you know, taking a look at my goals, uh, taking a look back at what I previously did the week before 
I look back at all the things that I've done. I give myself a rating, uh, you know, a rating out of five. How was that week? And it's like, well, how did I come to that rating? Well, what were my wins? So I list three business wins and three personal wins. And often my wins come from helping others. So I'm not so self-centered. It's like, oh, I helped this coach do this. This coach did this. That's a win for me. You know, and so that's how I'm able to kind of step outside of myself and know that I'm moving the business forward if I'm helping other people get what they want. Um, and then I start to do what I talked about earlier. I start to strategize my week by building my business around my life. Where's my date night? Where's my family time? Right? All of those little things in my life. And then I batch my work throughout the week. So Mondays, I don't take any coaching calls. Mondays is just office day. It is day to work in the business. I'm sorry, on the business, not in the business. Tuesdays, I do coaching. I do phone calls. I do interviews. A lot more outpouring of my personality and outpouring. Again, Wednesday is more internal day. Half the day is spent just working on the business again. And then the, the second half of the day is being a little bit, uh, you know, creating uh, coaching again. Thursday is a coaching day, Friday is another half day, and then Saturday is a half day. But it's very important that I schedule the days where it's just me and it's just me working on the business. Super. And I love, I love the idea that you're planning business around life because uh, life for you is a priority. And so many entrepreneurs, they, as you said, right, they dive so, uh, I don't know how to even say it correctly. Uh, they are so in love with what they do that they forget everything else in life. But just like, uh, just like they used to live a nine to five, now they live like nine to nine and, uh, yes. but in their job, like in their, uh, and for, for many uh, entrepreneurs, uh, they get into business with, let's say, with the mindset of the, uh, of the nine to five job of an employee, they become self-employed they get stuck in the rut where they they just have to motivate themselves. They have to build everything themselves. And without that proper foundation of how to actually do it, how to structure, how to plan, where to get support from, uh, how to best focus in your business on what truly is your talent and what should you delegate or outsource. And so many questions like today's conversation is, value packed with ideas of how uh, even experienced entrepreneurs can look at their life, look at their priorities and actually understand, are they living life up to their values? Mm. Is, is their business in a place that it is supporting their life rather than they are sacrificing their life for their business? Mm. And isn't it the same thing if you're sacrificing life for the business, isn't it the same thing as being an employee and working for someone else? For sure. I mean, how many countless high level CEOs or very high influential people have always said back, they wish they spent more time with their families. They mm. wish they did, if they could, they had any, they could do it all over again. They would take more trips. They would take more vacations, right? I think Steve Jobs said it best, right? On his deathbed, he was like, he wished he had spent more time living, right? And there's all of these things that he wished he had spent more time on. And if you look at Steve Jobs, who we all look up as like one of the most successful entrepreneurs out there, right? Created this wonderful thing for us. For him to sit there and see that on his deathbed, that should give you some sort of inkling to say, okay, maybe I need to change course here and maybe I need to reverse. I believe there's freedom in that. I believe there's freedom and discipline. I believe there's freedom and structure. I believe there's freedom in getting really specific with the things that you want and holding mm -hmm. yourself accountable. To them. I believe that's where the freedom is. Mm -hmm. We get into this virtual online space for that freedom. And yet we become slaves to it. Mm -hmm. We become slaves to, you know, when you're not working, you're thinking of when you're, when you're not working, you're thinking about work. And when you're working, you're thinking about play. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. And so why not just create that? Why not just do it? Why not just take a little bit more time, a little bit more discipline and create that and this way you can have it. Yeah. And free them in the business you love. And, and uh, as, as they say, the, the core idea is that uh, you've mentioned that in your work process where you only invest Monday into being in the business and then you work on the business I mean, the other way around. Oh, yeah. uh, on Monday, you, you work on the business uh, and then all the other days, half a day you spend in the business and doing things. And uh, for, for all the entrepreneurs out there, I believe that the biggest restraint of business growth and business scale is the chains of your time. Mm. And if you don't structure your business in a way where it's not dependent on the time you invest into the business, then it's not a business then you're self-employed and that, that, that's, that's a big change. And I super love the idea that uh, just having um, planning business around life, th that is the best thing that we can ever gift ourselves and our family and our close ones. Yeah. Wonderful. So we, we've touched upon uh, a lot of things today, and uh, I want to touch uh, lightly upon the idea also to give a perspective. Like we talked about uh, inner growth a lot. Uh, let's, yeah. let's touch upon the surrounding. And uh, can you say what kind of surrounding um, actually, and did it have, of course you said it had, but what kind of effect did it have on your growth and success in what you do? What do you mean by surrounding? Surrounding basically people around you. Oh, my environment. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, oh my God. It is everything. I believe I've realized this and I've learned this. Your surrounding is everything. And if you want to grow, you need to be around people that are either where you want to be or further along. It's, we, we love our friends, we love our family members, but let's face it, sometimes being around these people are the causes of why we are where we are, right? If you wanna be rich, go around rich people. If you wanna be healthy and athletic, go be around healthy and athletic people. There's a thing that just happens to us with it's osmosis, right? We just, we attract this thing that we wanna be in when we're around it most. Mm. Um, so my surroundings forever, were always people that were lived in the past. You know, all oh, the glory days, man, tell the best war stories, right? All of these awesome stories. And so they were just living in the past. And I quickly realized that my bank account matched that mindset. The way I worked matched that mindset. And the way I treated myself matched that mindset. And my relationships, my romantic relationships, there were nothing to write home about. And I knew I needed to change. So that's when I started. That's when I left. New, you know, that's the, the first time I left Brooklyn was to get away from certain friends. And my life improved grass, drastically. Then I realized, okay, I'm only going to get as far. And I moved again. And I moved again. And I look back. Do I have these childhood friends that many people have? These long, I don't anymore. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I don't. But. What do I have is a continuous effort to improve the people that are around me. Mm -hmm. Continuous. Who can, who can I learn from? Who, who intimidates me? I like that now. I didn't like that before, but I like that now. I like being around people that I find slightly intimidating in a way that's healthy completely, but in a way that it's like, wow, this person's going to force me to level up. What, how does that play out? Like, uh, what do you mean by intimidating in this case? Oh, maybe they have certain influence or maybe they have a certain, they're at a certain level of their life where I'd like to get to, mm -hmm. right? And I didn't have a normal upbringing. I had a very, very weird upbringing, right? And my life looks very differently than many others. I used to be ashamed of that. I'm not ashamed anymore of it um, in fact, I'm very open now about it. However, when someone grows up around influence and all of these things, I like people that understand 
who have gone through their own stuff. Mm. They've gone through it. They've gone through whatever it is, right? And they're very open and honest about it. Um, mm -hmm. And so that can sometimes be intimidating. You know, when you see someone that's living their life completely in their truth. Mm. All right. I get you. Yeah, it took me a while to land that plane. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, it, when I see someone completely living in their truth, completely who they are, completely themselves, mm. and that's awesome. Yeah. And that's something that I continuously strive to Ooh, do. I get, I get goosebumps now <laughs> when you're talking yeah. about it. Yeah. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. And so that's, for me, that's important now in my surroundings. Mm. Super. Uh, what would you uh, recommend to people who are do find themselves in, that they are not in a healthy surrounding? Uh, what steps can they take? Like, I believe many find themselves there and don't know what to do with it. Uh, what can you suggest to them where to look at, where to search and how to get that surrounding that can help them grow? Number one is awareness, you know, become aware of what your surroundings are become aware of the people that you're keeping you know become aware of the relationships that you have in your life are they serving you right become aware number one then number two where do you want to go what do you want to learn right what do you want to learn where do you want to go once you have those things clearly defined then i would start to seek out groups you know, if you want a certain group, you know, a certain thing in your life, seek out groups. What's great about the internet is that it's made the world a very small place. And for instance, I knew I needed brotherhood in my life. I wanted brotherhood. I wanted more friends from, I wanted that masculine energy in my life. I was missing it since I've moved to Texas. I don't have strong brothers or friends in my life. And so, but I also knew I didn't want to just hang around guys. I wanted men who are very, who are also doing the work, who are mm -hmm. also learning about themselves, who are also ambitious. And so I sought out a group and I sought out a, a friend of mine uh, who was going to this group. And I'm like, Hey, what are you, wh what are you doing? And he's like, Oh, there's this group and it's a bunch of men. And I'm like, that's amazing. And so I started to make sure I got in there. Mm -hmm. You got to be resilient too. You know, sometimes those doors are closed and you just can't turn away from them. Sometimes you got to literally walk in and knock on that door and open the door yourself. And so awareness, understanding what you need, and then go out there and find these certain groups of people. I, I love the internet now for that, you know, um, community is something I learned 2020 we need more of. Mm. We've been very isolated. And if you're an entrepreneur, entrepreneurship can be very lonely. It can mm. be very isolating. You're working all day by yourself. Yeah, you're talking to customers, but you're not expanding anything else. So if you want to expand your circle, you need to go out there. What is it that you want to learn? What is it that you want to do? Go find other people doing it. Super. That is magnificent advice and a good step-by-step -step awareness process of how to approach it. I love it. So uh, wrapping up the conversation, what advice would you give to listeners that they can do right now? What actions to take right now to make the most out of 2021 in their business? Number one, reflect. Think about where you were last year. Who you were last year. What was your business like? Did you have a business? Right? Just reflect. Just take a quick, just take a, just, Oh, look over your shoulder. Take a quick snapshot. What are all the things you've accomplished? List them out. Right? We don't, we only should be looking back to only see how far we've come to learn. Boom. Take that snapshot. Then 2021, what do you want to create? What do you want to build? Get unreasonable. Far too many times, we're just trying to play it small. We're trying to play it safe. Become unreasonable. Get a little crazy. What do you want to do? What do you want to create? Who do you want to create it for? Who do you want to serve? You're only going to be successful by helping other people become successful or by helping others have some sort of success. So the greater opportunities you can do that, the more success you're going to have. So who do you want to serve and how do you want to serve them? And then take care of your body. 
Mm. Take care of your physical body. Make it a priority. Make it a priority to move your body each and every day. Sometimes when we're stuck in our business, when we're stuck creatively, it's because we're, we're, in our, we're not in our own head too much. You got to get out of your head, get into your body at that point. So go move it. Go do some yoga. Go do some breath work. Go do some meditation. Go take care of yourself. A great thing I started doing was ice baths and sauna work. It's fantastic. If you're on a screen all day like I am and you're just looking at you know, these blips, it is fantastic to reset your brain and your central nervous system. Go take care of your body. Go into 2021 with your, with your body and your mental and health recovery being a number one priority. Super. Uh, can you add a little bit more about uh, what can people do about their emotional health as well? Mm, great point. Number one, start journaling. Start journaling. If there's a lot of resistance, that's okay. Ask yourself, just write the question. Right? Just write the question, but start with some questions. Another thing, what are you grateful for? You know, I list three things I'm grateful for every day. Get yourself in that position, start journaling, um, because life isn't as bad as it really seems. It really isn't, right? When we can kind of take a step back and just find some things to be grateful for, we can calm ourselves down, right? Then go talk to someone. Go talk to someone, whether it's, and try not to, try not to have that person be so close to you, right? Go find someone that you can talk to that is able to detach themselves from your problem because you're too close to it. You're looking at that problem almost like you would look at your phone with it like two inches away from your face. When you go talk to someone that isn't so emotionally involved with you, they're looking at it from a 50 foot view and they're able to give you solid perspective from a non-emotional standpoint, very non-bias. Um, and you'd be surprised just talking, just talking allows you to figure out a problem on your own. Mm. Yeah. I learned that Talk, about talking it out to someone else, you get the insights that, uh, that you need. Yeah. yeah. You just spend two hours with me. I, I go off, I, 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 I land the plane very slowly. <laughs> so I know that about myself. I need, the way I make decisions, I just did human design, which is awesome, by the way. I learned that my decisions are made in my gut. They come to my heart. I need to go out of my, my I need to talk about them, go back into my gut. Most of us need to talk through our problems and then, oh, that's where it is. Mm -hmm. And if someone that's a good listener understands that, They'll just allow you to just talk and they'll ask you some good questions. So go talk to someone emotionally. Um, that's one of the best things you can do is journal, get inside, become very self-aware, and then go out, go talk. Beautiful. The last thing, and this is very important. This is so important. Whatever you learn, teach it. Teach it out. Because Jim Quick says it's the best. Whenever you learn something and you go teach it, you get to learn it twice. But more importantly, you get to detach from it. You get to understand that other people are dealing and experiencing this. Now, don't go like projecting. <laughs> don't just go, you know, you need to do this. I'm doing this. More importantly, share your information. Share your knowledge. Share what you've learned with the world. Because you're going to get more of it then. Mm. Great advice. I 100% hundred percent believe that as well. One of, one of the uh, people I've met uh, for, for the podcast, uh, she said that every time she gets to learn something new, she writes a book first. Mm. So she lays the foundation about the thing that she wants to start. Like every hobby she, she starts, she writes a book about it That's at amazing. first, like the first step. So she right. builds that foundational awareness of what the hell she's doing by writing that book. And then she gets to enjoy every, every nuance of it because she already knows the foundation. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you, James, for being with us. Uh, I wish you a happy holiday season, um, a blissful start to the new year. Uh, I believe that you're doing a wonderful thing uh, to the world. You are gifting a lot of a lot of wisdom uh, in this episode, and I believe on a daily basis with the people you serve. 
thank you for being here thank you for your time and uh yeah it was a pleasure to interview you thank you for having me man this was a great conversation i enjoyed it i mean i feel like we can probably go another two more hours i'm sure there's stuff we can continue to talk about uh, especially for both of our passions about you know the brain and you know understanding how that operates and healing and things of that nature so but just thank you i appreciate being on here i really do likewise you are listening to life origami podcast with alan lee thank you for tuning in i hope you found a lot of value in this episode would love to hear what you found especially valuable in the comments below and more information about james and his business can be found in the description to this episode